It's time now for a science news update. Joining us is regular Pulse contributor Carrie Grenz. Carrie is an associate editor with The Scientist, and in that role, she reviews a lot of scientific studies every week, and she keeps us posted on the latest. This week, her picks are young blood, female bats, and penguin flu. Hi, Carrie. Hi, Megan. Carrie, let's start with this research on young blood. I've seen a lot about this on social media, but what is really happening with this research? Well, I will tell you, don't go around drinking mouse blood. <laughs> Whatever you've seen on social media, it's, it might not be true. There is room for caution here. But there has been this idea for many years now that elements in the blood of young animals can rejuvenate older animals. And researchers have been looking for the secret sauce in the young blood to see if those components could be harnessed to treat injuries or age-related degeneration. And three studies came out this week that tested various parts of the blood from young mice. In one case, the plasma from young mice was given to older mice, and it helped them perform better on memory tests in the laboratory. In a second case, injecting just a single protein called GDF 11 caused the old mice to sprout new brain cells and blood vessels in the brain. This protein is more abundant in the blood of younger mice and then declines with age. And then in a, in a third study, researchers showed that GDF11 could also build muscle tissue and actually improve the strength and endurance of older mice. So together, these reports start to home in on the rejuvenating components of blood. What does all of this mean for humans. Is this a step closer to the fountain of youth that we are always looking for? We hope, um, maybe, <laughs> but <laughs> none of these experiments were done in humans. So it remains to be seen whether these ingredients like GDF11 or plasma or whatnot could actually slow or even reverse aging in people. And of course, there's always the concern when you're giving somebody an agent that causes growth in one way or another, whether it's a blood vessel or a brain cell, that it could develop into a cancer. So we are a long way away from finding the actual fountain of youth. Carrie, let's move on to some new findings on the so-called white nose syndromes and bats. What did researchers find out with that? So white nose syndrome has been a very big problem for little brown bats and other bat species, especially in Pennsylvania, but also many other states in the U.S. It's a fungal disease. And in the past five years or so, it has spread rapidly throughout eastern and central Pennsylvania. But for some reason, there was this little corner of western Pennsylvania that was a holdout against the disease for a couple of years. Researchers want to know why that is and how this fungus gets around. So they compared bat genes from uninfected and infected colonies of bats. And they found that bats from infected areas in eastern and central Pennsylvania had a certain set of genetic markers, while bats Bats from the uninfected holdouts of western Pennsylvania had a different cluster of genetic markers. These genes were only genes that are inherited from female bats. Genes that also come from males weren't so tightly contained to these distinct regions of the state. So the researchers conclude that it's the migrations of female bats that are linked with the spread of white nose syndrome. So will that help them contain the disease, perhaps? Hopefully. At least it might help them predict where the disease might spread next, and then from there, perhaps uh, stop its progression. Finally, let's talk about penguin flu. Do, do penguins get the flu, or do they have their own flu? They get an influenza virus, but they don't get the flu in the sense that, you know, they're they're sick, at least. This new type of avian influenza virus that has been detected in penguins in Antarctica doesn't seem to make them sick. But it's an unusual flu virus. It's not totally surprising that it was detected in Antarctica. There had been signs that the virus was there. Blood samples from penguins had indicated that there were immune responses to the flu, but they hadn't actually pinned down the virus. So scientists took a throat swab and a cloaca swab, that's kind of the all-in-one hole of birds, and they found the virus. And then they did some genetic analysis, and they saw that the virus is totally unique. Its closest related strains of flu emerged 
decades ago. So they don't know how it got to Antarctica, how long it's been there, and what precisely it's doing to the birds, because as I said, none of them really seemed sick. But is this one of those strange viruses that could then affect humans? Well, it, definitely not yet. They did expose ferrets to the virus, and the ferrets didn't catch it. So, you know, I don't think it's going to turn any sort of turn into any kind of global pandemic just yet. But of course, as we know, the flu can mutate very quickly and change. I think the concern is more for wildlife at this point than for humans. Thank you so much, Carrie. Thank you, Mikan. Kerry Grenz is an associate editor with The Scientist and a regular contributor to The Pulse.